Okay, well, we can start with, um, everybody got to hear that we have a special um, guest lecturer in the <laughs> class today, uh, my mom. Who, what, mommy, what do you want them to call you, Zeely? Zeely is fine, yeah. Yes, so my mom is, um, who's the, one of the greatest educators oh. I know, um, is going to be leading us into the conversation around teaching to transgress. But also, um, we're going to talk about some things that need to be talked about. And um, we haven't been together since Saturday. Um, and the terrible things that have happened in this world um, on Saturday and since Saturday. And so um, I think you know, it's something that we talked about um, in All About Love, we talked about death. Um, that was our last class, we talked about death and um, love and death and life and grief. And I do want to, um, we, the title of the class is Womanism and Black Feminist praxis, right? So this is not theory. This is also the way that we employ these tools that we're gaining um, and the ideas that we're engaging around. And um, we're going to be engaging with some of that and employing some of that and not just reading books, but um, also thinking about and um, allowing it to shape the way that we move in this world. And so we will deal with grief and mourning um, and we'll um, begin with some of that. But before we get to all of that, we're gonna start the class the way that we always do, which is our land, labor and life acknowledgement. And um, I want us to, uh-oh. I need screen sharing privileges. All right, you should have it now. Thank you. Um, and so we'll start with that, with the land, labor, and life acknowledgement. Now you get to see what we're doing for the whole class. There. All right. So teaching to transgress is absolutely going to be what we're introducing today. And we're beginning with our land labor and life acknowledgement. And I think that in the time that we're in, it reminds us why we should always acknowledge the land, the labor, and especially the life, the lives that built this country and the spirits that continue to demand that our lives are dedicated to greater freedom and justice. And so if you can, and we wanna remember that this entire class is voluntary, right? So um, we wanna invite you in to participate in this land, labor and life acknowledgement. If you're able to and willing, please put both of your feet on the ground and your palms up in your lap and sit in a way that enables you to get oxygen into your lungs. And we're gonna begin by taking a deep breath in and hold it for just a moment. Breathe out. And who can read the first slide, please? I'll, I'll read if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay, breath. This land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historic diaspora. Thank you. 
Who can okay. move the next slide and guide us in the next breath? Should I read or, or somebody else or? Yes, yeah, someone else if, if you can. <clears throat> we pay homage to those who were in Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel and forced in, into labor, who were called, but never submitted as such, who have all fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor which built what is now the Americas. Thank you. Let's take another deep breath in. And release. And who can read this last slide? To both, to both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Ashe. So I'll say Ashe. 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 Thank you, everybody. Do we have anybody who's joining us for the first time? Anyone joining us for the first time? I am, I'm joining for the first time. Um, my name is uh, Maria Elena Cortinas, and I live in Los Angeles, which is also known as the Tongva, the land of the Tongva people. And I go by the pronouns of she and her. And I'm taking this class because I want to uh, expand and understand um, Black feminism and womanism on a deeper level. Great to have you. To be under your, or your study. Uh, oh, thank you. Great to have you. Anyone else joining for the first time? Wait, how did that happen? Now Ebony is under your name and you're under Ebony's name. That's weird. So my mom is joining for the first time, but she's joining at, I'll, I'll introduce her um, a little bit later, but do you wanna introduce yourself, mommy? What happened, Melina, is that we switched from uh, my hand phone to the computer. So maybe things changed there. Oh, okay. So, so that so might be they're so both you. They're both you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you are not Ebony Abram. No, you I'm are... Zeely. Mm -hmm. I, I, there it is now. It's showing up. Z, I think it's showing up now. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. So do you want to introduce yourself, Mama? <laughs> okay, I'm I'm Linda um, Zeely. Blackston, <laughs> Melina's yeah. mom, and a former teacher, elementary school teacher. And I'm a senior, as you can see. <laughs> uh, I guess that's my identity now because um, I have a couple of kids and eight grandkids, three kids, eight grandkids. Um, I love teaching. I didn't know I was going to have to identify, have to um, um, introduce myself or I would have thought of something great to say. <laughs> I, I, um, it's all great. Huh? It's all great. Okay. You turn this off. Okay. okay. And you're coming from the Bay Area. You're in the Bay Area. Yes. I'm in, I'm, I'm in, um, in the Bay Area, right? Yes. Anybody so, else joining for the first time? I'm trying to turn this. Who is Vicky? Wait a minute. Is that our Vicky or another Vicky? Hi, um, this is my second class. I'm sorry. Oh, your second class. Okay. Yeah, so, but I'm still. So, you know, I saw your name and my mom's running buddies are Barbara and Vicky. And mm -hmm. I saw you next to Barbara and thought maybe it was my um, other auntie, Vicky, the, oh. uh, my other, another Vicky. And I was like, wait, did Vicky hop on and now the whole crew is on? 
but it's, it's <laughs> so that's so good. funny though because I also run so <laughs> no I mean running buddy like run the streets with buddy. oh Not my run. <laughs> <laughs> you could go run but thank y'all thank you for um yeah this is my second class thank y'all for making space thank you anybody else join in for the first time okay so we're going to hop into um, this conversation. And um, I just want to do a little bit of a recap um, for folks who are just joining and um, haven't been here before. But we pulled out some key ideas um, from the former text, the first text that we read, which was all about love by Bell Hooks. And there were key concepts, right? And I think the first concept was the definition of love, that love is the will to nurture our own and another's spiritual growth. Love is as love does. Let's hold that. Love is as love does. We talked about how there can be no love without justice. And then I kind of flipped what Cornell West says. He says that justice is what love looks like in public. And I said that love is what justice looks like in private. So we also have to think about our own love ethic as Bell Hooks talks about. She talks about truth telling. We talked about beloved community expanding her idea of friendship. Um, and then uh, mommy, where we landed um, yesterday or, or last week, one of the things that we landed on is love as a choice. And we talked about um, you and Baba as choosing love rather than just falling in love, choosing love. And um, what that means for the duration when you choose love for however many decades y'all been together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to, because the last chapter, one of the last chapters that we read, one of the last chapters that we read was about love, death, and grief. And Bell Hooks talked about her mother's passing. Um, we talked about what death means and how you love through death. Um, how life should be a celebration. And then Saturday happened. And I want us to all just pause because um, we deserve and honor our grief and mourning. I want us to pause and think about and honor each of these faces that we see on the screen. I want us to pause and honor Ms. Catherine Massey, who was known as Mama Cat, who was a 72-year-old community organizer, who was thought of as one of the mightiest forces in the city of Buffalo. whose life was stolen by white supremacist terrorism, and we should not call it anything less. I want us to say each name, and if someone could read the name next to Mama Cat's name. Hayward Patterson. Hayward Patterson was Deacon Patterson. Deacon Patterson used to drive people to the grocery store who didn't have cars. Deacon Patterson also, when we talk about black community, Deacon Patterson was the first boss of one of our members here in Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. We have a member named Lester Young and um, I'm sorry, Lester Powell. 
And he worked at, I think it was McDonald's where Deacon Patterson was his boss. Deacon Patterson will be buried tomorrow in Buffalo, New York. And our next name, can someone say her name? Earl Young. Pearl Young, who they lovingly called Pearly, Miss Pearly, 77 years old, was grocery shopping and I believe um, fed people in the park every single Saturday. So it was grocery shopping for the people was a grandmother whose life was stolen. Can someone read the next name? Celestine Cheney, the 65. Celestine Cheney. And I believe, yes, her family found out about her murder on social media. I believe Miss Celestine, or was it Miss Geraldine, had found love, recently found love, and was engaged um, to her beloved. And so, we mourn the loss of Miss Celestine Cheney. Can someone read the next name? Andre McNeil, age 53. Andre McNeil was a father, was beloved. I don't know much more about him. His life mattered. Yes. Ashe. Ashe. Next name. Roberta Drury, 32. Does anyone know anything about Miss Roberta? Sister Roberta. Sister Roberta was indeed a sister. She moved to Buffalo to care for her brother who was suffering with cancer. She was a caregiver to him. and we mourn her loss. Next name. Ruth Whitfield. How old was she? My sister was 86. Miss, Miss Ruth was 86 years old. Here's the thing. Grandmothers, we expect them to eventually pass. We expect them to pass as we're holding their hands and they share their last bits of wisdom and recipes and love and hugs and kisses. We don't expect them to pass in grocery stores at the end of a gun of a white supremacist terrorist. Miss Ruth's son was a fire commissioner. You can watch him speak about his mother if you Google that video. And he talks about both love and grief, but also rage. And we have a right to be angry. 
We have a right to be angry. Yes. Shay. Next name, please. Aaron Salter, 55. So, Brother Aaron was a retired cop who took a second career and had been working at the store for, I believe, four years as a security guard. The more and more we hear about what happened in Buffalo, and I'm just going to say what I think, like I don't often, <laughs> Police apparently had been reported to about this person whose name I won't speak. This young white terrorist who was seen as a weirdo, quote unquote weirdo, who was staking out the grocery store for weeks. They were called in and the um, police dispatcher got mad at the first 911 caller because she was whispering because she didn't want to get killed. The police apparently showed up in a matter of minutes. Two minutes, I think, is the report. They didn't save a single one of these lives. That shooter, that terrorist was allowed by police to steal 10 lives and shoot 13 people. It wasn't until by every report that he stopped shooting that the police moved in when he was turning the gun on himself. Uh, uh. Brother Aaron, who was no longer a cop, who was a security guard, is the only person who attempted to physically intervene. He shot the shooter, shot the terrorist, but the terrorist was wearing full body armor. And so did not, um, was not injured as a result of Brother Aaron trying to save these lives and instead took Brother Aaron's life. So this whole conversation about this is why we need police, no. This is why we need community who loves each other. Next name, please. Marcus Morrison, 52 years old. Marcus Morrison. And I don't know much about him other than he was a father, stepfather, and he went to buy food for a movie night for a movie night. I would imagine that that makes him a loving, fun human being whose family loved him and who loved his family. And then the last and final name, please. Sister Geraldine Talley, 62. Okay. So it was Sister Geraldine, not Sister Celestine, who was engaged and was um, shopping with her fiance. And um, was stolen, was stolen by this white supremacist terrorist. I just want us to think about what this means. I want us to think about our grief. I want us to take a moment, take the moment we all deserve to share how we're feeling, what this has meant for us over the last five days. What has this meant for you? How has this landed for you?
Well, it makes me ready for war. Hey, Miss Italy. Hey. What do you mean? What do you mean? Just exhausted. Just like, you know, sick and tired of, of, um, of, of this system that like shelters all this, this, this hatred and enables all this hatred. And it's like, I just really feel like how long, how many years, how many generations are we going to beg our oppressors mm. to stop oppressing us? It's just, I'm sick and tired. 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 I'm going to say this. There's a saying that there's nothing more dangerous than a people who behave as if we live in a state of peace when we're really at war. Oh, mm -hmm. can you repeat that, please? There is nothing more dangerous than a people who live as if, as who behave as if we're living in a state of peace when we're really at war. Right. War has been declared on black people. Yes. Yes. We have, there has been a war on us since they stole us from our homeland. There's been a war on us. There's been a war on us there and a war on us here and a war on us everywhere we inhabit this earth. And to live, to behave as if we live in a state of peace has allowed us to be almost solely victims. It's when we rise up that, um, that we're actually able to make demands and to shift the world, to change the world. And so I'm hearing what you're saying, Ms. Italy, is that, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but that's how I'm hearing it. How does that resonate for you? I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think that um, we, we would be, you know, remiss um, to continue in this way. I'm, and that's, you know, I know I sound like a radicalist and all that stuff, but it's like, I'm tired. Mm. I'm tired. And clearly we've done the research. Clearly we, it's been all these, you know, hundreds of years that um, nothing has changed. And so it's like, at some point, you know, the definition of, insa of, definition of insanity is doing something, expecting like a different do. result right. and doing the same thing. Right. And like, I'm just tired. That's why I'll be trying to link up with, with the groups that is, is doing the radical movement because when it's time, I'm going to be on the front line with the last fiber of my soul because I'm tired. Okay. Mommy, just so you know, Miss Italy, there was a whole group of people. I, do you know, know who she is? Yes, I do. I do. And I'm thankful for her. Is and that I'm your thinking mom? That's my you. mom. <laughs> oh, wow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm really thankful for you and I appreciate you. And, I, and today is um, Malcolm X's birthday. Mm. So really? it's a very special day. So when you were asking about it, I was thinking about what would Malcolm X be feeling on this, you know, as we we're talking about this. And um, I was looking, thinking in terms of what you just said, when we sit idly by why things are going on and do nothing, this has gone on in many, I mean, all of you who know history, at least some, even through TV or wherever, you know the the number of people who have sat by and watched as cultures have been wiped out off the off the face of the earth practically while no one did anything so we have to look at that and think about that and i'm thinking in terms of as a black woman i'm looking at as a elder i'm one i could have been one of those people that she listed i'm actually you know, 76 years old myself. So, and I thought about what would happen with my grandchildren, my children, what my thoughts would have been, and I would have been happy to go rather than them. However, I know I have many stories still to tell. 
So I want, I would, I would appreciate and I would feel uplifted and, and, and faithful and, and empowered by our, all of you, you know, realizing, looking at yourself and feeling empathy. Cause when you were calling those names, the feeling comes into you and mm -hmm. you must feel the empathy. I mean, when, when people don't have any sense of that, they can't, and it does, the person doesn't have to look like you. I mean, feel them, you know, have the spirit, ask for the spirit and faith to come into you so that you know that each of us is just here. We're all just spirits moving around in these shells that we have. So it's up to us to, to, to do something. And we have to stand up and I look around and I see the colors of the faces that are here. And I'm thinking, oh God, please give it to them. Create, let them become a bright light saying no more. Because I look at your faces and a lot of times I see your faces. My face is brown. I see a lot of light complexion faces and brown faces also. But at the same time, realize that we are you 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 understand we are you so just realize that and you have a job a duty when you say that thing it's our duty to fight for freedom it is our duty it really is our duty we have to as old as i am i would be very much willing to stand up mm. wherever you know Sorry, we're going so long. Thank you, Mom. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else want to share anything? We have to be moved. And the, the text we read is about recognizing that we live in a world that tells us to move only with our intellect, only with our head. We have to move. Nobody is thrust into revolution because they think about it. It's your spirit that moves you into it. So we have to recognize the role of spirit. We have to recognize the role of our hearts. We have to allow those tears to fall allow those tears to fall. We have to allow ourselves to mourn and then allow that mourning to thrust us into the hard work of organizing, of building, dreaming and building for the world in which we wanna live, right? So we can't just say Miss Pearlie's name. We can't just say Miss Ruth's name. We can't just say Mama Cat's name and not feel them. For me, you know, what I say and what I've been saying since Saturday, if you are black, you know that there is no one more sacred than our grandmothers, than our grandmothers. And, ooh, theft of these lives of these grandmothers. If you don't stand up for your grandmother, you're betraying our people, you're betraying yourself, you're betraying our ancestors, you're betraying what the creator calls you to do if you don't stand up for your grandmother, for our grandmothers. These are our grandmothers and people who loved our grandmothers who were stolen. So in this moment, we grieve, we grieve, allow ourselves to grieve and to feel. We had a Black Lives Matter meeting the next day on Sunday. And one of the things that Sister Tanisia said is this world has tried to desensitize us. We must never be desensitized so don't just see there were 10 victims or 13 victims. Say each of their names, learn all of their stories. Hear the son speaking about his mother. 
and feel that because when you feel it, it compels you into action. And so we have to move, we have to move, we have to allow our hearts to open. That's what all about love is. Allow your heart to open and allow yourself to use your heart and your mind together, your intellect and your emotion together. You know, somebody to me today, I guess they were trying to insult me and said, you know, you can't be led by emotion. And I was like, oh, what a sexist thing to say, right? It was, of course, a man that said it um, can't be led by emotion. And I'm thinking, we talking about a business deal. I'm not led by emotion. That was really sexist of you. I actually said that to him. But also, why are you minimizing the role of emotion, right? Emotion allows me to mother. Emotion allows me to love community. Emotion allows me to build beloved community and demand justice. So there's nothing wrong with emotion. Emotion is something that only patriarchy wants to stomp out because they want us to submit to patriarchy, right? So, you know, we're telling people who've been most conditioned to um, fall in line with white supremacist patriarchal capitalism to feel, to feel that emotion and allow yourselves to be open to what it calls you to do. And so I think we have to, I know we have to, I feel we have to um, allow that. As I was thinking, and I almost said his name, as I was thinking about the white supremacist terrorist that stole these lives, um, I thought about, and some of you have seen Joe Biden speaking, and I'm sorry for talking so long, um, but I think it warrants it. Um, heard Joe Biden speaking and heard these politicians speaking and heard people on MSNBC um, or CNN or whatever you watch speaking and talking about, this is why we need gun control. Well, the state of New York has one of the strictest gun control laws in the country. Um, this is not about gun control. This person would have found another tool to steal life, right? So it's not about gun control. Not that I believe that people should have assault rifles. They should not have assault rifles. But this person, we have to be willing to get to Miss Italy said, I know I sound radical. Let's all be radicals. This moment warrants radicalism. Radicalism means getting to the root of things. How do we get to the root of things? If we say this is white supremacist terrorism, then we have to root out white supremacy. We have to root out white supremacy. I think that it is necessary. This, it's fortuitous that we're moving. We've grounded ourselves in love and now we're moving to transgression and teaching to transgress. That terrorist was taught to be a terrorist was taught to be a white supremacist. All of these systems enabled him to be a white supremacist. From the system of education, where he revealed himself as a white supremacist, from his family structure, where he told on himself and they probably nurtured his white supremacy, right? From the media, which allows his white supremacy and coddles his white supremacy by calling him a boy and acting like it's a mental health issue that did this when they don't say it's a mental health issue when they kill black children who don't even have anything right when they kill black children who are playing in parks with toys right they don't say they, they give every excuse to the police then right so it's important that we think about how systems enable that white supremacy, but also how we are abolitionists and build new systems that undo white supremacy and usher in justice. So teaching to transgress is a really important read in this moment. Um, I want to just share a really early um, quote from the book. 
Um, Bell Hook says for black folks teaching, and she talks about stepping into her role as an educator almost reluctantly because she wanted to be a writer, right? But felt like she could only be a teacher, but also talks about what the promise of education was for her and what the experience of education was for her as a, as a revolutionary space, right? She says for black folks teaching, educating, was fundamentally political because it was rooted in anti-racist struggle. It was rooted in anti-racist struggle. So teaching to transgress is about recapturing what intellectual space, what educational space has meant for black people. And so I invited my mother on, not just cause she's my mother and I love her and I wanted to show her off as my mother, um, I wanted to lift her up as a black grandmother, um, because one of the things that I think that this moment compels us to do is wrap our arms around um, all of the grandmothers, the black grandmothers among us, but also because she is one who's been um, a teacher who is grounded in this principle, this principle of black education which is fundamentally transgressive and revolutionary. And so um, my mother is a true educator, was an elementary school educator. And that's what Bell Hooks talks about is her elementary school teacher providing this space, this wide open space of revolution. And my mother is one of those people. She's um, along with Bell Hooks, right? In terms of um, her generation, but um, has provided, has inherited this tradition of Black education um, that is meant to be a transgressive and revolutionary space where we can learn and be and practice anti-racism and step into our fullest selves. And so, Mommy, if you could just kind of talk about a little bit about your experience as um, a fifth grade teacher uh, fifth and sixth grade teacher um, in at it was Nystrom Elementary School in Richmond, California, which um, was a predominantly black school. And the way that you taught um, and what educate what it meant to you to be an educator. And also, I'll say that I'm a third generation educator because your mother before you was also an educator, right? In fact, everybody in our families <laughs> everybody's <laughs> an educator because my Baba's also an educator. My brother's an educator. My sister's an educator. My sister-in-law is an educator. Um, so everybody is an educator. But mommy, we learn it all and get the best of what we do from you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think parents, all of us are educators is what I feel because if you are a parent, even if you're not a parent, you can be an educator. But at the point that I came into it, I think you want me to talk about it as a teacher, as a teacher in the classroom. And you can, I, you I, can expand, mommy. You don't have to okay. find it to there. Uh -huh. Okay. But one of the reasons I want to say that one of the reasons that I went into teaching in the first place, I want to say that I was a, a what's called a, a math person. I was a I was educated as a math person. And for a black woman at that time to become a, a math, you probably have seen, uh, what is it, hidden figures and stuff like that. Well, that was what everyone was kind of doing. And that was kind of what happened with me. I was interviewed by IBM to go into programming and things like that. Well, I suddenly got, I got during that summer, I got into uh, working with children and I enjoyed it. Then I, I continued to work with them as a Miller math specialist. And then um, I said, I want, really want to be a classroom teacher. And the reason I chose elementary school was because I thought at that point it was so meaningful because as, as we talked about roots and rooting out things and building roots and growing roots, uh, I think that's, um, that's really what I think it's all about. It's like building that base, building the roots and, and, and helping the form healthy roots, looking at yourself, loving yourself as you're talking about love, loving yourself learning to love yourself so that you can love others. Uh, and as 
my my school was predominantly black. I, I worked in not, not predominantly, it was 99.9% black when I went into it because that's why I wanted to teach at that school. I actually talking about powers that be. When I went into education, they tried to put me in a different school because of my background. They wanted me to work with the white children, which I did work with, and they were great. The great kids, great kids, white kids. But I really went into teaching to teach black kids because I wanted them to have this fullness of self. And I felt that they needed to, we don't hear about our history. We don't know who we can become. We're not told that how beautiful and wonderful and smart we are. And that's one of the things, and we are some of the most beautiful, talented, wonderful people. And you have to grow that. And we have to grow that in each other. Any of you who are teachers, teachers, you know that. I don't care what complexion you are. You know that you have to grow that that love of self and love of the world and love of the earth. So, you know, so we have to grow that. So that's part of what my my philosophy is, basically, is that we are all teachers and we all have a duty to teach each other. And what you've been talking about here today, Melina, is teaching uh, each other. I feel that your job, <laughs> I'm here as a teacher for you now, I'm going to say you have to go out and teach someone because you have to teach them about what you're learning and what you're thinking, and what you're feeling, because if you don't share it, it's not, it's not going to become that. I have now, oh, maybe 20 teachers I've taught. Now we're talking about children who came from a very struggling background. They saw murders regularly in the community, okay? We would come back and every weekend after a weekend, someone, someone had, had passed away. There were no counselor, grief counselors for us. We had to do our own grief counseling in my community, the work, one that I worked in. And these children have gone on and a lot of them are, are, have become teachers and are doing really wonderful things in their community. So I appreciate them. And we have to know that when we pass that on, it's a super important thing and, and it can change everything. And that's what Melina's talking about. You know, if we go out there, you know, and change, I mean, this is not gonna happen with, I mean, the gun thing, <laughs> as you were saying, it's not gonna just, we have to change this and this. We have to change our hearts and our minds. And the white children that I taught when I told you about that year teaching them, the year that I had I taught with them, I had parents coming up to me thanking me. Now I have to tell you this is this was in a very um I'll just say it was racist uh, school that I taught in. In fact, one little girl walked up to me and said, I hope you don't think you're gonna take this white teacher that she has place. And I said, I'd never try to do that. I'm too happy being myself. By the end of the school year, she was embracing me. So it is about love and teaching love and sharing history. They have to know that we are people. The children have to know that we are people and we have contributed to making this country what it is. We built the country. I had to supply books. We had to, supply, to take them on trips, introduce them to, to er, areas of, that they had never experienced before because a lot of them didn't get out of the community. The, those are the things that you have to do. You have a responsibility to learn and to share what you learn. So hopefully that's what you wanted to hear. I don't know if I'm going on too long. No, that's great. I mean, everything you say is what I wanna hear, Mommy. Well, most of. <laughs> not, not most every of the time, most of the time. Um, I did want us to engage and I realized that we're at um, at 7.52. There's a few more things we need to get to. Um, I do wanna emphasize the book, right? Teaching to transgress, right? Oh. Teaching to transgress. That what my mother taught us and what she taught her students is also transgression, right? So if we think about transgression, transgression as, um, what, do, what do you think it means when we say transgress, teaching to transgress? Somebody quickly um, just offer what that means, what it means to transgress. Does it, uh, to transgress, 
to transgress? Does that mean to like become to, to move forward to become something better? Because say, say what you just spirit? typed. Cross, cross. Kind over. of, but Darnell just typed it. What you say, Darnell? Cross. To cross over. Wait, to, to cross over. Trans Darnell just typed cross. It in the chat. Darnell, you want to? Is that Darnell? Oh, Damali. Is that Damali? Sorry, that's why I need these glasses. Damali, can you unmute? Oh, Najuma. Okay. Oh, it's Najuma, Reverend Juju. Go ahead. Can you unmute? She can't unmute. Okay. Um, so she said to cross the line, to cross the line, to violate. Really, that's what you're talking about when you say transgression. What are you violating? You're violating systems that are in place that are trying to keep you boxed in, keep you within certain boundaries, right? The boundaries of white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism, right? The boundaries that told this man, this white man, that he should be the center of the world, right? The boundaries that empowered his white supremacy. You, we are teaching our folks to transgress every system that's in place. It's why Bell Hooks talks about she never wanted to be confined to the academy, why she was afraid and angry at the tenure system, right? It's why she talks about we're developing as intellectuals, but not academics, right? Because we want to feed our mind, we want to feed our intellect, but we don't want to become the system. Academic systems are problematic. Academic systems create hierarchies. Academic systems entrench capitalism, entrench white supremacy, entrench patriarchy, entrench uh, heteronormativity and transphobia, right? That's what these systems entrench. So we have to teach to transgress. So I thought I might be going too far when I was thinking about how do we undo white supremacy? You know, I think about my own emergence that my own emergence was because my mother is an educator in every space she is. And um, including like during our summers, you know, if we said we never dared say we don't have nothing to do because my mother would hand us a math book and like an eighth grade math book we'd be in sixth grade she'd go here do this <laughs> and, um, and we never wanted to do that right but she was an educator in every space right educator for the neighborhood educator for all the kids right who would come sit on our porch as she taught them to read right but she was also teaching transgression how to disrupt spaces. How do we disrupt spaces? Um, I was also educated through Black Studies and Mr. Navies at Berkeley High School, right, to transgress, to disrupt things. And so I think about how those forms of teaching enabled me to think differently about myself and enabled me to have, gave me the audacity to believe we could transform the world. And I know Ooh, it's 7.56, so I can say a few more things. I know that it sounds like a lot, but I really think that when we're talking about ending white supremacy, we have to all be teachers who teach people to transgress, who disrupt the system of white supremacy in all of our teachings, in our teachings as parents, in the ways in which we operate in amongst our friend circles, in our workplaces, if you really are an educator there, you know, we have to be willing to do that in every space. And I think that that begins, so this is the last thing that I wanted to share, and I'm sorry if we go a few moments over time, um, but I did want to, um, why is this not working, okay. I wanted to absolutely, can y'all see that? Can you see the slide? Yes. Yeah, great. I wanted you to see this because I think that it's really important. And if I share this with Michelle, she can email it to you, right? Yes. Great. 
um, here's your homework. That as we teach to transgress, we need to be clear about what it is we're dreaming and building. And we have to be um, transgressive in our own thinking and building. That means visioning, and I warned you about this, that we were going to do some work of visioning, do some visioning work. So your homework is to go home, to be transgressive and steal some time back for yourself. I don't care when it is. Um, maybe it means that your kids got to eat fast food. Maybe it's that you took a little time off you weren't supposed to take off. Maybe you, you know, I don't know, whatever you got to do to steal 30 minutes, steal some time back, get into a meditative space. And after you come out of that meditative space, which should be at least, let me say at least 10 minutes, preferably 20 minutes, you should have a pen and paper right next to you and you should write. What is your vision of the world? What is your vision of the world? Transgression means stepping over the line of what is and daring to dream, daring to freedom dream the world in which you want to live. And so your freedom dream, your vision of the world should be imaginative. It should offer an overarching worldview. It should be narrow so that it's clear in its direction. It should be agreeable because you don't sell this because you're going to teach it, right? Re agreeable to and within the grasp of your targeted group. It should be concise, meaning you're not writing for pages and pages. You're writing one run-on sentence, right? It should be allowable for the more the building of more clearly defined goals, and it should be achievable. We are going to build visions. And in our next class, we're going to share back these visions. And then we're going to talk about how we teach them, how we teach our people, all of our people, to transgress by embracing radical vision and ushering that vision into being. If we can do that, we can be a people who understand we are at a state of war. We are in a state of war. Transgression, violating what is, the willingness to step over a line is a tool in our war, is a tool on our side. It allows us to be warriors, right? We don't have to be warriors with an AR-15. We have to be warriors with intellectual tools, with spiritual tools, with emotional tools, with empathetic tools. We have to be warriors with um, our willingness to teach, to transgress, to put our lives and our body on the line. We have to be daring with ourselves. We have to disrupt spaces. We have to be completely open to how we can be used to usher in these radical imaginings, these new visions, these freedom dreams, because if we don't, someone else's plan for what this world is to be will come to pass. And we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. We said 10 names tonight and we said 11 when we named Minister Malcolm X, al Haj Malik El-Shabazz, right? When we say our own grandmothers and great grandmothers names, they demand that we do something and build something better than we have. And so this is a moment for us to acknowledge that we're at a state of war and it's a war we can win if we fight. And so I'm gonna leave it with that and apologize for taking two extra minutes. I'm gonna also ask that you all um, follow our work. Um, Ebony and I, and um, you know, hopefully hundreds of others are headed to Buffalo tomorrow. Um, and there's some who are already there on the ground. Um, we're doing spiritual work there. So this is spiritual work that we're doing. If you can hop on a plane, 
or if you're already uh, on the East Coast, we invite you. Um, we're gonna do a vigil um, and engage in every single spiritual tradition that we have among us. Um, if you want to come, please come. If you don't wanna come, but wanna offer some energy, we're gathering at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. So if you want to, in that moment, be intentional in offering prayer and energy, please do. Um, because that's the what we're grounding ourselves in as we do work to end white supremacy and usher in justice. Um, so that's where we're headed tomorrow. And I'm very, very grateful for this space with you all tonight and look forward to seeing you next week. Anything before we go? Thank you for meditating with us, Miss Italy. Thank, Thank you, you, Reverend Juju, for the prayers. All right. Hope to see you all next Thursday. Okay. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you.